She began her life as a young girl named Norma Jean, a girl desperate for a stable family and home life, a girl seeking to find her place, a girl nobody wanted, who grew up in the care of foster families and caretakers. As a young teen searching for her identity, she became determined to make something of herself and created a life born out of her dreams, imagination, and talent. Marilyn became a top cover girl model, a young starlet, a celebrated actress, an accomplished singer and dancer, a wife, aspiring mother, a producer, and ultimately a legend, an enduring icon. Licensed mental health therapist, national certified counselor, and Marilyn Monroe biography author, Gary Vitaco Robles. As a mental health professional, in writing my two-volume biography, Icon, The Lifetimes and Films of Marilyn Monroe, I realized that one can't accurately tell the story of Marilyn Monroe's remarkable life without the context of her challenge of battling serious mental illness and addiction. Part of Marilyn's enduring appeal is the empathy her life and pain evoke in each of us. From a mental health perspective, Marilyn breaks the stigma surrounding mental health and addiction and offers transformation. Her story increases our awareness of these important issues. In this premier dramatic multi-season podcast series, the first 10 episodes take you on a journey into Marilyn Monroe's young life as Norma Jean. In extensive detail, our podcast illustrates how Norma Jean's early life experiences impacted Marilyn's later years. Season one begins with our first episode, titled, Please Let Me Out, which explores a pivotal time in Marilyn's life. It's 18 months before her tragic death, when she was admitted to a psychiatric hospital in early 1961. By the mid-1950s, Marilyn proved she could act, sing, dance, and do comedy. She achieved star status and was known all over the world. Yet Marilyn herself said the achievements of fame and money still left her with feelings of depression and despair, and that her life seemed as wrong and unbearable to her as it had been in her earlier years. January 31st, 1961. It is a time of deep disappointment, sorrow, and betrayal in Marilyn's life. Her latest film, The Misfits, premieres in Manhattan. As an uncredited producer, Marilyn had high hopes for its success. However, the film garners mixed reviews. Several critics are downright scathing, unfairly mentioning her unflattering physical appearance and harshly judging her performance and the film's somber story. Soon after The Misfits' completion, a man she truly admired, her co-star, Clark Gable, dies unexpectedly. Her marriage to Arthur Miller ends in divorce. The combined weight of these tragic events plunges Marilyn into a serious and major depressive episode. Alone in her Manhattan apartment, on the 13th floor, Marilyn has impulses to end her life. I opened the living room window as wide as I could, and I leaned out. I knew that I had to make my mind up inside the room. If I climbed out onto the ledge, someone below would be certain to recognize me, and it'd be a big spectacle. I squeezed my eyes shut at the open window, and I clenched my fists. I remember reading somewhere that people who fall from heights lose consciousness before they hit the ground. And I looked down, and I saw a woman walking along the sidewalk near my building. She was wearing a brown dress, and I knew her. Maryland psychiatrist at the time, Dr. Marianne Chris, 
sees Marilyn's depression, exhaustion, and dependency on barbiturates is escalating out of control. During a therapy session, Marilyn admits that she had a sudden urge to jump from the window of her apartment. Greatly alarmed for her safety, Chris convinces Marilyn to voluntarily admit herself to a New York psychiatric clinic for treatment. At this time, Marilyn is experiencing mixed episodes of both major depression and mania, which are classic symptoms of bipolar disorder. During the mania, she can't sleep for days. It's well known that Marilyn was often medicating herself just to sleep as the mania kept her awake. When an individual is depressed, she may not have the energy to act upon suicidal thoughts. Yet in a mixed episode of both depression and mania, the mania provides the impulsivity, poor judgment, and energy that increases the individual's risk to act upon suicidal thoughts. Stones on the walk. Every color there is. I stare down at you like a horizon. Space. The air between us beckoning. And a many stories up. My feet frightened as I grasp towards you. Marilyn's emotions and state of mind were being affected by a number of factors at the time. First, in the early 1960s, there were few mood-stabilizing drugs to treat the symptoms of bipolar disorder. Doctors prescribed addictive sedative barbiturates. At that time, lithium was used experimentally for those who were accurately diagnosed during the era. Second, Marilyn was attending psychoanalysis sessions with Dr. Chris 47 times in two months. Her treatment focused on the expiration of her childhood deliberately returning to her painful history of complex trauma, two to five days per week. Psychoanalysis in the early 1960s did not teach coping skills for distress tolerance or grounding techniques, so Marilyn is constantly being triggered by revisiting her childhood trauma. Third, Marilyn is taking acting lessons with Lee Strasberg after nearly every therapy session. Strasberg's exercises in sense memory instruct her to go back into her traumatic past for inspiration on tackling a role or to elicit raw emotions. So, when you sum it up, the bipolar mixed episodes, the constant sleep deprivation, the addictive medications, the psychoanalytic dredging up of her past on a regular basis, the acting lessons pulling her back into emotional states of her traumatic childhood, all these factors combine into a recipe for psychological disaster. You can see why Dr. Chris assessed Marilyn as a threat to herself and a high risk for suicide. Dr. Chris was obligated to prescribe inpatient treatment to keep Marilyn safe. This is why Dr. Chris instructed Marilyn to admit herself to the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Unit of New York Hospital. Inside the facility, the staff escorts Marilyn into a locked unit for moderately disturbed patients. Wearing a fur coat, casual blouse, and brightly colored plaid slacks, she passes through several locked doors. Marilyn is made to surrender her personal possessions and clothing. The admission staff searches her for materials or objects that could be used to inflict self-injury. Dr. Chris had not prepared Marilyn for this level of security. What? What are you doing to me? What kind of place is this? Marilyn would later describe the secured environment, where light switches, dresser drawers, and bathroom and closet doors were locked. The doors to the private rooms contained unobstructed windows so the staff could see and monitor patients at all times. Steel bars covered other windows. Marilyn saw strange scrawled messages from former patients and the markings of past violence on the walls. 
She could hear the disturbing sounds of screams from other female patients echoing through the halls. Marilyn is placed in seclusion in a cement block room on the sixth floor, deemed for very disturbed and depressed patients. According to an admissions nurse, for over an hour, Marilyn stood at her door and calmly but endlessly pleaded. Please open the door. Just open the door. I, I won't make any trouble. Just let me out. Please open the door. Let me out. Sitting alone in the white concrete walled room, the stark reality of her predicament dredges up Marilyn's deepest and most terrifying nightmare. The same nightmare she had over and over since childhood, that she would become like her mother, mentally insane and institutionalized. Marilyn's ordeal stretches out hour by hour. Her mind, her will, gaining an inner strength, clearly focused on one goal, to escape. And now, our story continues with part two of Please Let Me Out. I gotta get out of here. Oh my God. Why did I agree to this? This is wrong. I'm not my mother. I'm not my mother. How did I end up in here? What is it? Losing my baby? And Arthur? And Clark? I gotta make some sense of it. Think back. Think back. But... <gasps> Cut. November 1960. Production wraps on the movie set of The Misfits. Its all-star cast includes Marilyn in a role written by her playwright husband, Arthur Miller, to showcase her dramatic talent. It also stars Clark Gable, Marilyn's childhood idol, and her friends Montgomery Clift and Eli Wallach. Marilyn and Arthur Miller promised their independent production of The Misfits would be a great American film. But troubles on the movie set with cast and crew, constant changes to the script, the ongoing health issues of its stars, and a highly strained relationship between Marilyn and husband Arthur take their toll. The film that was promised to be Miller's Valentine for Marilyn only leads to their marital separation. November 6th, just days after filming wraps on The Misfits, Clark Gable collapses and is rushed by ambulance to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. He is diagnosed as having suffered a heart attack. Marilyn and Arthur return home to Manhattan in separate planes. He moves out of their midtown co-op residence. The Millers agree to an amicable divorce. Ten days later, Clark Gable has a second heart attack in the hospital. The King of Hollywood is dead. Marilyn does not attend Gable's funeral for fear of collapsing and becoming a spectacle and to be respectful to his pregnant widow. Marilyn was truly devastated by the death of Clark Gable. 
a man she had idolized since childhood. She later confided to newspaper columnist Sidney Skolsky her feelings of guilt for keeping her co-star waiting for hours on the set. She ruminated over the possibility that she had subconsciously substituted Gable as her father and displaced her hurt onto him, essentially punishing her father through Gable. Too many years of Freudian therapy taught Marilyn to search for subconscious motivation behind her behavior. In addition, the media erroneously and ruthlessly blamed Marilyn for Gable's death, citing her chronic tardiness on the misfits and requiring multiple retakes, creating stress. But we now know that Kay Gable had written to Marilyn and maintained a friendship with her afterward. Kay even commented publicly that the press's accusations against Marilyn and her husband's death were totally unfounded and she even invited Marilyn to the christening of her baby, born after Gable's death. The holiday season brings some needed healing to Marilyn. She spends Christmas Eve with acting coaches Lee and Paula Strasberg. Returning to her apartment, Marilyn finds a very large delivery of poinsettias from a local florist. Publicist Pat Newcomb hands her the card that came with the flowers. All the card says is, Best, Joe. Joe DiMaggio invites Marilyn out by phone. They meet and quietly talk in the dark corner of Le Pavilion Restaurant on East 55th Street. Marilyn, I, I have to tell you, you really saved my life by encouraging me to start psychoanalysis with that shrink recommended by Dr. Chris. I also have to admit to you, darling, that after how I treated you, well, frankly, I would have wanted a divorce if I had been in your position. I appreciate you saying that, Joe. I'm so happy the psychoanalysis has helped you. It's been helpful for me, so I just wanted to what was best for you. You used to bottle up your feelings when we were married. You would get so angry and then explode. It was frightening. And you used to hurt me, Joe. Oh, I know. I know, honey. I, I know. I, I'm just so sorry. That's, that's, that's all over now. I'm I'm not like that anymore. I'm learning to get those feelings out and get control of myself. I'm I'm a different man now. I I promise. I can be better. I will be. I've got a list of, of notes to help me. Here, here t take a look at these notes I wrote after I did my sessions. Why, that's a Sports Illustrated magazine. <laughs> yes, I know. I I wrote the notes down on the magazine so I could remember them. <laughs> That's just like you. All right, the first line says, um, Don't ever be critical. Well, that's helpful. The second is, Forget ego and pride. I like that one. Talk from the heart. Oh, I love that one, Joe. Be warm, affectionate, and love. That's beautiful. Uh, number five is, uh, don't be a, and don't be a. I can't make out your handwriting. It says, don't be a shit. <laughs> I see that now. And look at number six, baby. Uh, be patient. And you wrote. After that, the words, no matter what. Yeah, and this time, I'm serious, darling. And number seven says... The lucky number seven. No jealousy. That's so wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me, let me read the next part. Let's see here, uh... Yeah... 
Remember, this is not your wife anymore. She is a fine girl, and remember how unhappy you made her. Happiness is what you strive for, for her. Don't talk about her business or her friends. Be friendly towards her friends. Don't forget how lonesome and unhappy you are, especially without her. Goodness, you don't know how happy and hopeful that makes me feel, Joe. I'm glad. I just want you to be happy. Joe's revealing and heartfelt honesty brings the couple together again, and they remain in each other's company through the holidays, rekindling their deep relationship. January 1961. Marilyn files an update of her last will and testament. A few days later, she flies to El Paso, Texas, and crosses the border into Juarez, Mexico. In an arranged night court session, she completes divorce proceedings by herself. Arthur Miller is not in attendance, choosing instead to attend the inauguration ceremony of President John F. Kennedy. Marilyn calls Arthur Miller to arrange a visit to collect some of her property from their former home in Roxbury, Connecticut. When Marilyn arrives, she finds Miller already gone, having moved to the Chelsea Hotel in New York City. She had expected to meet him at the house they once shared. Later, as Marilyn is collecting her possessions, she discovers another woman's perfume on one of her fur coats stored in a closet. She later admits to disposing that fur coat. A short time after this, Marilyn's longtime friend Norman Roston sees Marilyn in person. He says he had never seen her in a more depressed state. A few weeks after this, Dr. Marianne Chris advises Marilyn to admit herself to the Payne Whitney Psychiatric Unit of New York Hospital. Marilyn has been experiencing a severe major depressive episode with symptoms of hopelessness and suicidal thoughts. But now she is also likely experiencing a mixed episode of both depression and mania. The mania brings impulsivity, irritability, poor judgment, and an increased risk to act upon her suicidal thoughts. There was no empathy at Payne Whitney. I was in some kind of prison for a crime I hadn't committed. The inhumanity there I found archaic. They asked me why I felt I was different from the other patients. So I decided if they were really that stupid, I must give them a very simple answer. So I said, I just am. Marilyn may have felt that her fate would follow her mother's and her grandmother's. Both women languished in state psychiatric facilities. But in Marilyn's case, the admission into Payne Whitney elicited fear and anger. The anger propelled her away from suicidal impulses and into fighting for her life and her freedom. At the Payne Whitney Clinic, a nurse tells Marilyn that she has been admitted to the hospital's psychiatric unit. It might be good for you to mingle with the other patients. Can do what? Well, Miss Monroe, you could sew or play cards, even checkers. Or maybe knit if you'd like to. I tried to explain the day I did. They would have a nut on their hands. These things were the furthest from my mind. Marilyn leaves the exam room and walks toward the elevator. In the hallway, Marilyn sees a young patient looking at her. The girl has visible scars near her neck and wrists. Why do you look so sad? You'd feel better maybe and not so lonely if you telephoned a friend. I would, but the staff told me there aren't any phones on this floor. Oh, really? Well, I hurt myself here and here, and they let me use the phone. I'll take you to it. 
The woman shows Marilyn the location of the telephone the other patients are using. Marilyn joins the line behind a few others, waiting her turn. A guard is close by. When Marilyn steps up and reaches for the receiver, the guard sees her and quickly steps in and strong arms the phone away from Marilyn. You can't use the phone. Marilyn was prohibited from making any phone calls and taken back to her room. Angry at the staff's dishonesty, Marilyn considered her next step. At this point, Marilyn may have gotten an idea from the girl she met in the hallway. Marilyn imagined what she would do if given her real-life situation as an acting improvisation. In the 1952 drama Don't Bother to Knock, Marilyn portrayed Nell Forbes, a psychotic babysitter who had a history of suicide attempts. Marilyn used her training as a method actress, returning to this moment in her past using a sense memory technique. Unfortunately, this strategy ended up backfiring on her. Marilyn picks up a chair and starts slamming it on the locked bathroom door window glass to break it. If you're going to treat me like a nut, I'm going to act like a nut. Marilyn picks up a piece of the broken glass and sits calmly on the bed, working her improvisation like the character in her old movie. The banging and shattering glass draws the attention of two male and two female orderlies who unlock her door and enter the room. What's going on here? She what are broke the window. If you're not going to let me out of this place, I'm going to harm myself. Put the glass down and come quietly with us, Miss Monroe. No, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here on the bed. We can't have this. Let's take her down. Be careful. All right, grab her arms. You get her ankles. What are you doing to me? Let go of me. No, where are you taking me? Get to the elevator. You're going to the seventh floor. The orderlies are concerned Marilyn will harm herself. As they carry her face down by her arms and legs, Marilyn weeps quietly. She is transferred to a padded cell on the upper floor unit where the most disturbed psychotic patients are placed. When the steel door to her cell slams shut, Marilyn cries and screams, banging her fists on the door. The staff assumes she is completely psychotic. Marilyn is placed in a restraint, her arms bound, and then she is sedated. Alone and unable to communicate with the outside world, Marilyn spends 48 hours in a living nightmare. Now, the hospital staff knew who Marilyn really was. She said that during the night, there was a steady procession of hospital personnel, doctors and nurses, gawking at her as if she were some kind of a curiosity piece. Then somehow, while confined in isolation, Marilyn collected herself well enough to write a frantic letter to the Strasburgs. We're not exactly sure how Marilyn mailed this letter. She may have been assisted by a staff person. We do know that the Strasburgs received Marilyn's plea for help on February 8th. This is the letter Marilyn wrote to the Strasburgs while in confinement. Dear Lee and Paula, Dr. Chris had put me into the New York Hospital Psychiatric Division under the care of two idiot doctors. They both should not be my doctors. You haven't heard from me because I'm locked up with all these poor nutty people. I'm sure to end up a nut if I stay in their nightmare. Please help me, Lee. This is the last place that I should be. Maybe if you called Dr. Chris and assured her of my sensitivity and that I must get back to class so I'll be better prepared for rain. Please help me. If Dr. Chris assures you I'm all right, you can assure her I am not. 
I don't belong here. I love you both. P.S. Forgive the spelling. There's nothing to write on here. I'm on the dangerous floor. It's like a cell. Can you imagine cement blocks? They put me in here because they lied to me about calling my doctor and Joe. And they had the bathroom door locked, so I broke the glass. But outside of that, I haven't done anything that isn't cooperative. Marilyn is finally permitted to use the telephone and calls Joe DiMaggio on February 9th. Fiercely loyal and protective, Joe swiftly arrives at the hospital the next day, demanding that Marilyn be released into his custody. The doctors refuse, saying that Marilyn cannot be released without the approval of Dr. Chris. DiMaggio phones Chris. Dr. Chris? This is Joe DiMaggio. And you listen very carefully. If you don't release Marilyn tomorrow, why well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take your hospital apart brick by brick. Mr. DiMaggio, I will release Marilyn from pain with me only if she agrees to enter a hospital of her own choice. I will make that happen. On February 10th, the next day, Joe waits at Marilyn's apartment to avoid the press. Ralph Roberts, Marilyn's loyal and trusted massage therapist, arrives at Payne Whitney with Dr. Chris and picks up Marilyn at the delivery entrance. After the car pulls away, Marilyn begins screaming at her doctor, letting loose her anger and fury. Roberts later described the scene saying Marilyn was like a hurricane unleashed. Dr. Chris had never seen a patient so enraged. Later, after dropping off Marilyn, Robert drives the highly unsettled psychoanalyst home. As they inch along the traffic on the West Side Highway, Roberts described Chris trembling and repeating over and over. Oh, it did a terrible thing, a terrible thing. Oh, God, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to, but I did. Marilyn later confided to the Strasburgs that she had always feared she would, quote, go crazy like my mother, unquote. But once surrounded by patients with acute psychosis, her perspective changed. Marilyn did realize that she had serious problems, and indeed, she needed inpatient treatment. However, she wasn't as disturbed as the psychotic patients on the ward. With guidance from Dr. Chris, DiMaggio arranged for an admission to a facility Marilyn would find more humane. She agreed to enter the Neurological Institute of Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, contingent upon DiMaggio's promise to visit her daily. Marilyn spent considerable time processing and recovering from her experience in the first hospital, Payne Whitney, a trauma that might have overshadowed the very reason for her admission in the first place. Marilyn had been depressed and suicidal, but the manner in which the professionals had treated her elicited an anger that propelled her out of the depression and gave her a reason to fight for her life. Marilyn recorded her experience at the Payne Whitney Clinic in a letter now archived in the Ralph R. Greenson Papers Collection at UCLA's Department of Special Collections. The letter conveys Marilyn's insight during one of the most harrowing experiences of her life. She symbolizes her process of healing by describing the spring returning to the world she sees outside her hospital room. Just now, and I look out the hospital window where the snow had covered everything. Suddenly, everything's kind of muted green. The grass, shabby evergreen bushes. Though, the trees give me a little hope. The dead 
desolate bare branches promising maybe there'll be a spring maybe they promise hope so I started to write this letter about four quiet tears had fallen I don't know quite why For the facts behind the scenes portrayed in this episode, be sure to listen to our companion podcast, Norma Jean, Discovering Truths, a discussion around the historical events drawn from Marilyn's life, which we are using to create the dramatic narrative in every episode. For the complete experience of our series, visit our website at BehindTheIcon.com where you can listen to every episode and also follow the story through historical photographs, videos, and exclusive anecdotes. You can subscribe on the website to join our community and get special updates about the series. On Facebook, search Maryland Behind the Icon and stay connected to our social posts. Subscribe to the audio series of Maryland Behind the Icon on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or where you're listening now. We'd love for you to give us a review or rating if you're enjoying what you're hearing. You can also support the show and the production by checking out the offers from the advertisers and sponsors you hear in the show or find on our website. This dramatic audio series is based on the two-volume biography by author Gary Vitaco Robles titled Icon, The Life, Times, and Films of Marilyn Monroe.